Tara. Hey, Ting Ting. Can you, you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. I just want to make sure my microphone is okay. How's it going? It's going. <laughs> How are you? Are, you? are you still in China? Yeah, I'm in Shanghai. Cool. Are you coming to China anytime? Mm, well, maybe after COVID, <laughs> when yeah. everything goes back to normal, then I can go back to China. Now it's too complicated. <laughs> yeah. It's not complicated, it's just a pain. Yeah. I have a standing desk. Um, oh, how's that working for you? It's really good. Um, so you but you're can, sitting though. Yeah, so you can you know change the position of the desk and stand or sit at the desk. So it's really convenient. Okay. Are you okay? Do you usually sit or stand? I already stand. Um, yeah, I feel okay. like I can move around. <laughs> okay. Do you give your Zoom talk standing or sitting? Sometimes standing. Um, sometimes sitting, but now most of the, because I need to teach, uh, and then uh, most of the lectures are in person now. Okay. What class do you teach? Um, intro to neurophysiology, um, graduate farm pharmacology, because I'm in the, in the pharmacology department. Wow. Uh, and then some of the journal club discussion. Wow, that's a lot of teaching. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this semester is a bit busy. <laughs> Usually, it's better in the in the fall semester, but in the in the spring semester, it's a bit. How many hours uh, do you have to teach? Um, let's see, uh, different for different classes. I think for the grad farm, it's um, I do not need to teach the entire class. I need to teach a few lectures, so maybe six six hours um and then for yeah for other classes it's like a few hours per class so it's not oh. that bad yeah well wow. do you want to test your slides Ting Ting? yeah uh, let me see hi ben hello thanks for coming <laughs> thanks for having me uh, Ting Ting's about to test her slides, and then after that, perhaps you could share yours to test. Let's see. Can you see my slides? Do you want to do the full, the play? Yeah. yeah, I'm in the screen mode. Can you see it? Yeah, You're in presenter you mode. Yeah, just toggle between the. Yeah. That thing, yeah. Nothing. Uh, switch. Wait. Switch. No. Switch to that display settings. I think. Or you. You're in sort of the pre presenter tools thing. Sometimes Zoom gives you a, a window two for when you're using PowerPoint. I've noticed. Yeah. Try that one. That should work. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Good. Okay. Yeah, I have two monitors, so maybe I have, yeah, okay. Does this work now? Perfect. Okay. Right. Oh, and um, Ben, do you want to test your slide? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah, let me exit. All right. Stop share. Okay. Let's see if mine, uh, let's see if I'm doing it this way here. Um, Where's my go button? Sorry, I'm trying to figure out where my go button just went to. All right, can you see that? Yeah. That works. That I see the title screen. You you're still seeing a title screen here. Modeling neural. Yeah. Okay. Now it's yeah. Next slide. Good. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And it's full screen mode, right? Yes. Yes. Excellent. All right. Because I'm presenting from a window, so it kind of sometimes <laughs> always throws me off a little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How's everything going out in California? 
Oh, it's it's good. I mean, it feels like this is a quiet place in the world right now. <laughs> I'll say. Uh, so yeah, it's actually a lovely day. I mean, we're, we're we have great weather right now. I mean, LA often does, but it's particularly nice right now. Mm-hmm. COVID's down. <laughs> Enthusiasm is high. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see another variant. We'll knock that, knock that enthusiasm out. <laughs> if it's not a variant, it'll be some other <laughs> we're all, we're all another scandal or something. <laughs> yeah. And is there still mask? mask mandate in LA or is that going away? It's so they've, they actually just uh, repealed it as of fr- last Friday from um, it's, it's now like, there's no mandate for like restaurants, bars, gyms. Uh, but, you know, people are still doing it voluntarily. And there's a debate about uh, taking it away from schools. Like schools are now allowed to like, the kids are allowed to go maskless outside which my son's school was already always doing because it's a private school. Uh, but they're, I think they're, they're now making it for the public schools. I think that's like around March 11th, I think is the, the date that they're planning on, I think at least allowing for unmasking. UCLA made the, the determination that they're gonna stick with masking until the end of the term, just because I think they were worried about uh, that just sending yet more confusing messages that everyone will then screw up. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So, so, I, but I think come spring, we might, we may be going to unmasked and that would be awesome if that's true. What's, what's it, what's it like with you? Um, so I moved at the beginning of the summer to Shanghai. So right. here there's not really any COVID um, cases, but there's masks. Like we wear the mask on the subway and, and stuff. Yeah. Hey, Ron. Hey, it's long. I think I wear the new zoom hoodie. Oh, now. nice! Looks good. Yeah, lower the camera so I can see the logo a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna wear it wow. for the ARS meeting. Oh. <laughs> nice! Looks great. That's good fit. Season. Yeah, it's now the uh, spring season, so be great. Yeah, nice, nice. Hi, Ting Ting. Hi, it's Long. How are you? Pretty good. We're a lot of time to see. It's yeah. <laughs> 15 years, right? It's unbelievable. 15 years, yeah. <gasps> so you have a, you have a colleague with Haiyan, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Haiyan uh, Haiyan is in biology department. We're okay. in different departments, but yeah. Well, it's, it, it, she, she's my uh, co- classmate in college. Really? Wow. Yeah, college. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So long. I went. I met up with uh, Sha Chun on Friday. Oh, yeah, nice, yeah. nice. Yeah. And some other guy, like the guy from Kunming, was there. Kunming. Okay, as several guys in Kunming. Yeah. Tian, Tian Shu also from uh-huh. Anhui. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. I'm trying to uh, set my computer. Hey, Ben. Uh, yeah, looks good. Yeah, I'm trying to set my computer. Right. Did you get to California at all, Ting Ting? Or are you just staying in DC? Oh, I'm staying in DC. <laughs> yeah. I had a nice couple of Zoom calls with Gray Davis recently. Oh, really? Yeah. I haven't seen uh, Gray for, for a while. Yeah. I didn't travel at all in the past two years, I think. Um, oh. Yeah. We're doing all this single cell sequencing and, and different de- degenerative disease models and like, uh-huh. the homeostat idea keeps coming up. So we just cool. wanted to chat about it with him. Uh-huh. Oh, I see Dion's here. Is Dion here? 
Yeah. Or someone named Dion is here. It's probably the Dion. But. <laughs> Even I know that Dion. Everyone knows him. <laughs> the college student won't know, right? It's, it's last generation. Yeah. Dion. I guess USC is pretty close to UCLA, right? Well, it really depends on the traffic. <laughs> it's like an LA thing, but yeah, I know it's it is pretty close. I mean, Samantha used to be on the um, you know, camp, she used to be on the faculty there. So of course, I got a, a lot of opportunities to get to know people in the USC side. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I wish we had if if it wasn't for traffic, it would be it would be you know like fifteen minutes, and um, you know that would be great for interactions, but. Unfortunately, it takes a little longer. Do you ever watch Curb Your Enthusiasm? I have. I haven't watched it in a while, to be honest, but yeah. So I don't know LA, but like there's a scene in it where Larry, Larry David sort of is on a date and like they ask to tell each other deep secrets that they've never told anyone. And Larry's secret is like he knows a good shortcut to the valley and like <laughs> <laughs> I did it make sense to me because I don't know the road, but he named it. And then she's like, whoa. And then sort of it was like how to get, get to the valley, like around traffic. So uh, you can like Google, like see it on YouTube. I'll have to look that one up. Yeah. It's a bit of a trope because I mean, like there's the, the SNL Saturday Night Live skit, the Californians where they'd kind of like always lapse into some discussion about some like crazy route going through Los Angeles, most of which is just gibberish, but like, but it's all names you've heard of, but it makes absolutely no sense. Like the roads don't connect and all that. But uh, so it's <laughs> one of my favorite, actually like traffic things for LA is uh, there's a scene in this movie called LA story, which is from with Steve Martin, where they come up to this, he drives up to this and he's in a residential area, which I'm pretty sure must be Beverly Hills. Cause I drive through this area regularly. And it's mm -hmm. like, you go to this, it's like six way intersection. And then everyone sort of stops very patiently and then all goes all at the same time and crash into one another. And it, it, I know that intersection or intersections that are just like that. And every time I come to it, I always think about this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so long. should we start? Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to another Neuro, week of NeuroZoom and looking forward to hearing talks from Ting Ting and Ben. Uh, just to advertise next week, we have two great talks. We have Pei Lin Chung from Academia Sinica and Su Yu Zhang from uh, Jiao Tong University. So tune in next week, uh, check out the YouTube channel, like, subscribe to it. You can get all the, the recordings. Um, and then let me or Zilong know if you'd like to talk about your latest research. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, and um, now our first speaker is Ting Ting and Zilong will introduce her. Thank you. Okay, uh, it's my great, a great pleasure to introduce Ting Ting Wang. So uh, uh, first time, I still remember the 15 years ago, uh, Matt Ting Ting is uh, beautiful San Diego. I said Vern, right? It's so uh, this postdoc where. So uh, Ting Ting has graduated from Tsinghua University, one of the most prestigious uh, universities in China. After Tsinghua, also, also uh, she, she went to Duke, worked with Mark Ellers, uh, worked on start to work with snaps uh, in mammalian uh, mammalian animals. So after PhD, uh, Ting Ting start to thought, thought about what uh, study uh, snaps is more simpler an uh, organism uh, with fly. I worked with uh, Greg Davis and uh, UCSF. Uh, um, ever since uh, uh, she's still using fly, fly to analyze the uh, homeostatic aspect of uh, uh, SNAP physiology. So after postdoc, uh, TT started her own lab in Georgetown University for a few years already, right? So today we're happy to uh, have TT to tell her latest. Uh, welcome, TT. Take it away. Yeah, okay. I've been here for three years now. So let me let me share okay. my screen. Uh, Great. Um, can you see my uh, PowerPoint? Oh, you might want to switch the uh, display. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, great. Good enough? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Tsilong, for the generous introduction. Um, 
So today I will talk about glial epigenetic signaling in homeostatic plasticity. Um, so my lab is very interested in homeostatic plasticity, which is a form of uh, synaptic plasticity that stabilizes neural function. Um, so homeostasis is a uh, basic cellular process by which uh, our body responds to different uh, perturbations to maintain a constant physiology. These perturbations could be uh, genetic mutations or environmental changes or uh, disease states. So our nervous system is uh, also stabilized by homeostatic uh, plasticity, which is very important for neurodevelopment and circuit function. So we know that in the nervous system, uh, neurons can actually uh, modulate uh, presynaptic neurotransmitter release and also uh, postsynaptic uh, receptor abundance and distribution to regain a balance between excitation and inhibition in the presence of perturbation. So homeostatic control in the nervous system is quite robust and uh, quite precise. This is actually a quite challenging um, problem for the nervous system because it's always easier to change things than to stabilize things. So for example, if you want to change the temperature in a room, you can uh, turn on a heater or air conditioner. However, if you want to really stabilize the temperature, you need a pretty complex feedback system. The same challenges apply to the nervous system. So in the presence of the perturbation, these neurons first need to detect the changes by using these sensors, and then they need to compute the magnitude of change and also use effector molecules to offset the perturbation so that it can rebalance excitation and inhibition. So in the past 15 years also, or so, um, molecular mechanisms of homeostatic control in the nervous system start to emerge. And also, um, Many studies now uh, have demonstrated that a normal homeostatic regulation of neural activity are associated with many different neurological disorders. If you have an imbalance, uh, excitation and inhibition may have abnormal, excessive brain uh, cell activity, and this may lead to epilepsy. And also increasing evidence suggests that uh, homeostatic regulation is uh, linked to molecular linked to uh, neurodevelopmental disorders and autism spectrum disorder. And more recently, uh, several labs demonstrated that um, homeostatic plasticity can actually stabilize uh, neural function, synapse function uh, in neurodegenerative disorders such as ALS and Alzheimer's disease. So my lab is uh, very interested in cell cellular signaling homeostatic plasticity. Um, so we use both Drosophila melanogaster fruit flies, and also mammalian synapses to study the molecular mechanisms of homeostatic plasticity. Um, so in Drosophila, the uh, model synapse that we use is Drosophila neuromuscular junction, uh, NMJ. So this is a glutamate-ergic synapse, and presynaptic motor neurons release uh, glutamate to activate the postsynaptic glutamate receptors. And all the release uh, neurotransmitter release machineries and glutamate receptors are highly conserved in Drosophila. Um, also, glial cells are distributed at the Drosophila NMJ so that we can uh, use different genetic tools to manipulate the expression of different genes and perform large-scale genetic screens to find molecules that are necessary for homeostatic plasticity. And then we further study the function of these molecules in the mouse brain. We're also very interested in using the software to generate disease models that carry different human genetic variants that are related to different neurological disorders so that we can use the software to study the function of these disease risk genes and also the consequences of different uh, human genetic variants that are related to neurological dysfunction. So our idea is really simple. So if homeostatic plasticity is a form of regulation that stabilizes the neural nervous system can we really find molecules that are necessary for homeostatic plasticity? And by promoting the function of these molecules and homeostatic regulation, maybe we can find a potential treatment of these different neurological dysfunctions by stabilizing the uh, nervous system. So uh, the form of homeostatic plasticity with that study uh, at the Drosophila neuromuscular junction is presynaptic homeostatic plasticity. So here is a schematic to show you the NMJ. Uh, neurotransmitter release from presynaptic terminals activate these glutamate receptors in the postsynaptic muscle. And then uh, neurotransmitter release from uh, individual vesicles generates small depolarizations or miniature uh, EPSPs in the postsynaptic muscle. 
if you trigger action potential in a presynaptic motor neuron to induce synchronized release, then you have a EPSP or evoked response uh, in the postsynaptic muscle. So now if we use a uh, pharmacological blocker of glutamate receptor philanthotoxin to inhibit um, these postsynaptic glutamate receptors, mini HR EPSP amplitude is reduced. Uh, and also the EPSP amplitude is reduced right after the drop application. If we wait for 10 minutes, very short period of time, um, the EPSP amplitude, the evoked response, is actually uh, retargeted back to the baseline level, even though the miniature release is still impaired. Um, so because there is an increase of neurotransmitter release uh, from the presynaptic terminal to compensate the perturbation in the postsynaptic cell, uh, we call this, uh, this form of homeostatic plasticity presynaptic homeostatic potentiation, or PHP. So PHP can be induced very rapidly by using this uh, uh, pharmacological blocker of glutamate receptor. We can also uh, use a uh, genetic deletion mutant, scular 2 a uh, deletion mutant, uh, to examine the sustained ex uh, expression of homeostatic plasticity. So scular 2 a is a subunit in the postsynaptic glutamate receptor, which is specifically expressed in the postsynaptic muscle. Because this is a genetic mutation, uh, glutamate receptor function is also perturbed, so they have small miniature EPSP, but the uh, evoked response in these glar 2 a mutants are uh, the same as in wild type. So because this is a genetic mutation in the animal and exists for a very long time, uh, so PHP can also sustain for a very long period of time. Uh, and apparently, um, retrograde signals and or intercellular signals are required for this uh, this form of uh, homeostatic plasticity. This is an evolutionary conserved process. It's conserved from the soft law uh, to mouse and to human. So in the past about 10 to 15 years, several different labs have performed uh, genetic screens to find, try to find different molecules that are uh, required or um, necessary for this uh, homeostatic plasticity. And so here is a, a, a picture to um, demonstrate some of these uh, signaling molecules that are found to be important uh, to regulate neurotransmitter release in PHP. I'm not going to get into the details here, but some of the postsynaptic kinases and signaling molecules are necessary for PHP. And also, um, it has been demonstrated that, that there is a compensatory increase of presynaptic calcium influx and increase of the readily releasable vesicle pool um, during uh, homeostatic potentiation. So um, most of these molecules uh, or genes that have been identified uh, for homeostatic potentiation either function presynaptically or postsynaptically. So there is another um, cell type, these glial cells that are localized to the neuromuscular junction. So the function of these glial cells in PHP is not well studied. So little is known about the function of these glial cells in homeostatic potentiation. So when I was a postdoc in Gray Davis lab at UCSF, I got really interested in the function of these glial cells in PHP. And um, so they're actually, let me first introduce to you, give you a brief introduction about these peripheral glial cells. So there are actually three different types of peripheral glia. So if I label these, uh, the cell body of these uh, glial cells by GFP, and you can see that the by green color, you can see these glial cells actually are localized on the surface of these uh, peripheral nerves, which is labeled by red color. This is a HRP stand. And then uh, I labeled the glial nuclei by uh, staining the um, glial specific transcription factor ripple. So you can see that these glial cells really wrap up the uh, peripheral nerve. If we, if we do a cross-section and then look at the uh, localization of these glial cells on the EM level, electron microscopy level, you can see there are actually different three uh, types of glia. The wrapping glia is the most inner layer of glial cells that separate the uh, individual axons. So perineural glia actually form the uh, blood-brain barrier uh, into cell and perineural glia is the most outside layer of glia. And these glial cells are also localized to the neuromuscular junction. Here again, we're looking at this beautiful synapse of MMJ, and uh, the glial cells are labeled in green. And you can see that they localize to the synapses. Um, the red color is the presynaptic motor neuron terminals, and you can see that they form these photons on the postsynaptic muscle. So on the EM level, these glial cells also uh, 
may cause contact with the neuromuscular junction. So I want to emphasize that these peripheral glia do not cover the entire neuromuscular junction, but some of the uh, signaling factors secreted from these glia can actually uh, diffuse to the synapses and be localized to uh, presynaptic active zones, these release sites. Um, and they may, these secreted factors may regulate neurotransmitter release. So I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the talk. So um, the first experiment that I did uh, to look at the function of these glial cells is to disrupt the secretory trafficking in these peripheral glia. So the idea is really that I think the secreted factors from these glial cells and also the signaling factors uh, or receptors that are expressed on the plasma membrane might be important uh, for the glial cells to uh, communicate with neurons. So um, I take advantage of the uh, ER2 Golgi trafficking because we know that these, uh, the ER2 Golgi, Golgi uh, secretory trafficking is important for secretion and insertion of these newly synthesized receptors. So I um, inhibit the, inhibited a fun the function of a uh, SAR1 GTPase, which is important for the ER2 Golgi trafficking. And uh, when I look at homeostatic plasticity, I found that in the uh, wild type animals, when we apply philanthotopsin, the miniature EP EPSP amplitude is reduced because these glutamate receptors are inhibited. Um, the EPSP amplitude is retargeted to the baseline level in the wild type animal. However, if we use RI uh, to knock down the SAR1 GTPase, uh, in perineuroglia specifically in this case, we found that the EPSP, the evoked response, cannot be retargeted back to the baseline level. So this indicates that presynaptic homeostatic plasticity uh, uh, is completely abolished in these mutants. So here is the quantification. We're looking at the normalized data here. So in the wild type animal, the uh, miniature EPSP is reduced to 50%. And then there is a compensatory increase of quantal content. So quantal content is a, um, the EPSP divided by the miniature EPSP amplitude. So this is the estimate of the number of vesicles that are released uh, from the presynaptic motor neuron. So there is a compensatory increase of neurotransmitter release from the uh, presynaptic motor neuron after philanthotopsin treatment. Uh, however, if we knock down the SAR1 GTPs in these uh, glial cells, um, the compensatory increase of quantum content is abolished. So this really indicates that these uh, peripheral glia are necessary for homeostatic potentiation. This is also the first evidence that we got suggesting that these peripheral glia are required for PHP. So I started the work at, at, as a postdoc in Gray Davis lab, and now I have my own lab and we continue our genetic screens to find molecules that are important or function in glia for homeostatic potentiation. And today I will talk about uh, the function of a histone acetyltransferase protein complex uh, that function in glial cells for PHP. So um, the SAGA complex is SPT ADA GCN5 uh, acetyltransferase protein complex. This is a giant protein complex, which is composed of about 20 different molecules. It's highly conserved from yeast to Drosophila and also to human. So this protein complex has two major activity. One is a settled transferase activity. The other one is deubiquitinase activity. So what it does is to deubiquitinate and acetylate histone so that it can open the chromatin and activate transcription. So the um, this protein complex is necessary for upregulation or um, active, activate gene transcription. Um, so first, we disrupted several different components in the saga complex, uh, including two acetyltransferases, GCN5 and beta-2B, and also two deubiquitinases, including uh, non-stop and SGF11. Um, so first, when we look at these mutant animals, we found that when we apply philanthotoxin, this uh, pharmacological blocker of glutamate receptor, the uh, EPSP amplitude in these eta 2 b mutant is completely, is uh, dramatically reduced compared to its baseline level. So this indicates that there is no increase of release uh, in these uh, mutant animals after philanthotoxin treatment. So here is the quantification. 
Um, so again, we're looking at normalized data, and you can see that in these ADA 2B, GCN5, and uh, SGF11 mutant when we disrupt different components in the saga complex, uh, rapid induction of homeostatic plasticity is completely uh, blocked. Uh, we also look at the sustained form of homeostatic plasticity, presynaptic homeostatic plasticity. So in this case, uh, when we look at the GLUR2A mutant alone, in this mutant, uh, the GLUR2A subunit of the glutamate receptor is genetically deleted. So you have a reduction of miniature EPSP amplitude, but an increase of compo content. If we look at the double mutants of eta 2 b GLUR2A or SGF11 GLUR2A, this uh, compensatory increase of quantum content is abolished. So this suggests that the saga complex is necessary, also necessary for the uh, sustained form of homeostatic potentiation. Then we tested if the saga complex function in these peripheral perineural glia for homeostatic potentiation. We use, when we use a motor neuron specific or muscle specific golf for driver to knock down ADA 2B, we still observe uh, an increase of quantum contents after flansotoxin treatment. However, if we knock down it to B, uh, GCN5, non stop, these different saga components, specifically in glial cells, um, the rapid induction of PHP is abolished. And then we can rescue this by resupplying the ADA to B, this uh, transgene, uh, specifically in glia in the ADA to B1 mutant. So this really provides strong evidence that the uh, saga complex function in um, perineal glial cells for the rapid induction of uh, homeostatic potentiation. When we look at the uh, long-term or sustained expression of homeostatic potentiation, we found that uh, very similar to the rapid induction, uh, when we disrupt the uh, different saga components in the uh, perineal glial cells by RNI, in these glar 2 mutant backgrounds, uh, this increase of compo contents is also blocked. So this suggests that the, the saga complex really function in the uh, perineal glia for uh, both the rapid induction and sustained expression of homeostatic potentiation. So we know that the saga complex is important for uh, histone acetylation. So two major histone acetylation sites uh, for the saga complex is, is H3K9 and H3K14. So it can acetylate uh, the lysine 9 and lysine 14 site on a uh, histone 3. So uh, with wondered if there is upregulation of histone acetylation uh, in the, during the sustained form of homeostatic potentiation. So we wonder if these glial cells can really actively respond to the perturbation in the postsynaptic muscle uh, when we uh, disrupt the glutamate receptor GLUR2A. So what we did is to label these perineal glia nuclei with a fluorescent uh, protein, red fluorescent protein restinger, which is tagged by a nucleus localization sequence. So the uh, peri perineal glia uh, nuclei are labeled by this red color here. And then we use the antibody that specifically recognized H3K9 acetylation to look at the acetylation level um, in the gluar 2 and wild type animal. And surprisingly, we really found a uh, increase, dramatic increase of H3K9 acetylation in these uh, perineal glia uh, nuclei in the gluar 2 a mutant. And this upregulation is completely abolished in the gluar 2 a ADA 2 b double mutant. So this suggests that these glial cells can regulate its own uh, histone acetylation in response to the postsynaptic perturbation. And this upregulation of histone acetylation is mediated by the saga complex. We did the same experiment, uh, but look at uh, histone acetylation 14 H3K9, uh, K14 acetylation, and we saw similar pheno phenotypes. So there is an increase of uh, acetylation uh, in the GLUR2A mutant, but this is blocked in the double mutant. So this really suggests to us that these glial cells can actively respond to the long-term perturbation. And because H3K9 and K14 acetylation are uh, positively correlated with active uh, gene transcription, so that we think there might be an upregulation of gene transcription in these glial cells during a uh, sustained form of PHP. 
So then we wonder, what are the target genes that are really controlled by the saga complex because it's epigenetic regulation uh, protein complex. And we also uh, showed that the secretory function of the glial cells are important for homeostatic potentiation. So we wondered if there are any um, factors that are secreted from the glial that are controlled by the saga complex during long-term PHP. So uh, in the literature, it has been reported that the multiplexin the ECM extracellular matrix molecule is the target of the saga complex in Drosophila. So multiplexin is a uh, Drosophila uh, collagen 18. So the mammalian homolog of multiplexin is collagen 18. And this molecule, the multiplexin molecule in Drosophila has three different functional domains, N-terminal thrombus bonding like domain, a collagen triple helix domain, and a C-terminal anostatin domain. So first we uh, tested where this molecule is expressed. Is it as the saga complex uh, target gene is really expressed in the peripheral, in the perineural glia? So we use a protein trap line, this DMP. DMP is the soft multiplexin. So we use this protein trap line to look at endogenous expression of multiplexin in Drosophila. So we found that the, um, Drosophila, the endogenous multiplexin is expressed on these peripheral nerves and also are expressed at the synapse. And then when we use um, perineural glia specific GAL4 to knock down these DMP, the multiplexin molecule, uh, in glia, we find the endogenous multiplexin expression is abolished. So this suggests that the endogenous multiplexin is really uh, synthesized in these uh, perineural glia. We also did a antibody staining to look at the surface multiplexin because this is a extracellular matrix molecule. So we use the antibody to detect the uh, secreted multiplexin without permeolizing or fixing the cell. So basically we will feed this antibody against multiplexin to the preparation. And then uh, after the, we feed the antibodies, we did a uh, wash and also then uh, stable uh, permeolizing and fixing the, the, uh, the preparation and then stand with a uh, active zone marker BRP. So what we found is that these extracellular multiplexin molecules are distributed uh, on the synapse. It covered the entire synapse and also these uh, extracellular multiplexin are distributed to the presynaptic active zones. So this is where the neurotransmitters are released and we think that these uh, extracellular matrix molecule can regulate the neurotransmitter release during homeostatic plasticity. And we also tested if the multiplexin molecule is um, controlled, the expression of the multiplexin is controlled by the saga complex. So we look at the multiplexin expression in wild type animals and also in the ADA2B1 mutant. So we found that the, indeed the saga complex control the multiplexin expression level and there is a dramatic reduction of the expression of multiplexin in the ADA2B mutant. So next we uh, tested, is this glial secreted multiplexin necessary for homeostatic plasticity? We use RNI against multiplexin to knock down the expression of this molecule by using uh, uh, glial specific GAL4 drivers, two perineal glial drivers. Uh, GAL4 driver or a uh, panglial uh, GAL4 driver. In all three different conditions, we uh, observe a complete block of uh, the rapid induction of homeostatic plasticity. And also we tested the sustained expression of PHP and we found that a real multiplexin is also necessary for the sustained form. So this, this is um, really uh, suggesting to us that the glial secreted multiplexin is necessary uh, for homeostatic plasticity. And so this is the last data slide that, that I have that I have, but I want to show you this striking phenotype. Because we observed this um, upregulation of histone acetylation, H3K9 and K14 acetylation in these glial cells in the glar 2 a mutant during the sustained form of uh, homeostatic potentiation. So we wonder that as a target of the saga complex is the expression or the protein level of multiplexin modulated in the long-term sustained expression of PHP. So we uh, did antibody staining to look at the expression of DMP multiplexin uh, in wall type at the NMJ and also in the glar 2 a at the neuromuscular junction. So we observed this dramatic upregulation of multiplexin protein expression at the synapse. And what's striking to me is that we 
observe this upregulation of multiplex and not only restrict it to the neuromuscular junction. We also observe this upregulation of protein expression level of multiplex and on the peripheral nerve and also in the ventral cord. So this is where the motor neuron cell bodies are and here are the quantification. So we think that although we don't know completely understand that why there is a systemic increase of multiplex and expression, um, not only at the synapse, but also on the peripheral nerve and in the ventral cord. But we think or we speculate that this uh, increase of multiplex expression uh, might be involved in the homeostatic regulation on the circuit level and might be important for the animal to maintain a, a stable motor function. Okay, just to summarize uh, today's uh, talk, um, so we look at the function or glial epigenetic signaling uh, in homeostatic potentiation. We find that the histone acetyl uh, transferase protein complex, saga complex, is important for homeostatic plasticity. So what we think what happened at the baseline is that these glial cells secrete um, ECM molecules to the synapses. So they already deposit some of the important uh, molecules to the extracellular matrix. And then when we apply philanthotoxin, this uh, oncological uh, glutamate receptor, we can induce some very dynamic change in the extracellular matrix. Um, the multiplexin, for example, is a one signaling molecule that is secreted from the glia to the ECM. We think that when we put on philanthotoxin, there is a very dynamic regulation of multiplexin. We published another paper uh, showing that the C-terminal's endostatin domain is actually very specifically regulate the, it does regulate the presynaptic uh, calcium influx very specifically during homeostatic potentiation. Um, so we think that in the long-term or sustained form of homeostatic plasticity, um, there is upregulation of uh, histone acetylation and also gene transcription in these glial cells. And they secrete more signaling molecules into the extracellular matrix. And this is not, this signaling is not restricted to the NMJ and also propagate to the uh, peripheral nerve and also the the uh, cell bodies um, of motor neuron in the ventral cord. So we're in the process to uh, figure out why they propagate or uh, how the signal really can, the uh, glial cells really communicate with each other and also with motor neuron um, to facilitate or promote presynaptic neurotransmitter release uh, during homeostatic plasticity. Um, so just as a summary for um, some of the take home messages, we think that extracellular matrix is a signaling reservoir um, for homeostatic plasticity. And we think that these glial cells can actively respond to changes in other cells and are actively uh, involved in homeostatic plasticity. Um, so with that, I want to thank people in my lab. And um, so we started here at Georgetown three years ago, and we have a very beautiful campus. And I, I also want to thank the funding resources uh, that support our work. Great. OK, thanks, Cindy. Oh, we have time for a few questions. Time. Uh, Ting Ting. Oh, that's really, really interesting. Um, so, so these neuromuscular junctions are known uh, not to release neurotransmitters in an even manner, um, meaning that some of the active zones are more uh, active uh, uh, than others. I wonder whether there is a natural uh, variation in terms of uh, the multiplexin localization and whether uh, that- yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So uh, if you look at the release probability um, by calcium imaging at the active zone level, actually the release probability is a bit different. So there are actually two types of glutons, one S and one B, and then the, uh, there are two different motor neurons uh, that innervate the, the same muscle. And then the one S glutons or the one S release sites has a uh, higher uh, release probability. And in terms of, uh, so, they do have different release probability and uh, they may, you know, the 1B, 1S actually have different functions in, in homeostatic plasticity. In terms of the distribution of multiplexin, uh, we didn't look at it carefully. So we didn't really uh, look at 
if the multiplex and this ECM molecule is more enriched at a release site with higher release probability. That's something that's very interesting where with the calcium imaging at the single active zone level, we may have some answers for that question. Yeah. Okay, so one more question on the chat board. Ha do you want to ask yourself? You can you can move yourself and you ask him directly. Oh, thanks for the beautiful talk. I was just wondering if you looked at any mutants where the PNG are slightly disrupted and if that actually changes how multiplexin is secreted. And um, just if you had any speculations about how these glia cells are actually sensing the PHP at these active zones. So how do they sense the perturbations in the postsynaptic cell? Um, we do not know. I don't have a good answer for that because we're still doing genetic screens, but I can speculate. We, we have several hits now um, for the uh, receptors. Some of the signaling potentially may serve as signaling receptors on, the, uh, on these glial cells. Some of these receptors are actually really required for glial development. So it's, we're in the process to dissect the function of these receptors for development and also for uh, homeostatic uh, potentiation. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, one last question though. So, Tini, so do, uh, do I suggest is uh, uh, will be the gene expression over uh, upper regulation in the uh, the glial part during mm -hmm. PHP, right? That's yeah. something you're suggesting, right? So, remember, so, so long term, my, my old business with uh, MCB2 is getting yeah. down series. There was some kind of kind of uh, epigenetic uh, uh, increased methylation. So, would you be as uh, maybe you can check on the uh, glia, maybe something you know, over methylation going on there? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we haven't looked yet. Um, so definitely there is DNA methylation and uh, histone uh, methylation, right? So we haven't looked at it yet. Bec we look at a histone acetylation because of the this uh, protein complex, the acetyl, uh, histone acetylate, uh, acetyltransferase protein complex come out of the screen. So ongoing screen. So that's why we focused on the histone acetylation first. But I, I think there might be some uh, different type of uh, epigenetic regulation going on in the glial cells. Some detail in your single cell sequencing may, may really help, right, to figure out. Yeah, so <laughs> what we're doing RNA-seq uh, in these animals, and we try to find the downstream target genes uh, okay. that are controlled by the saga complex. So I didn't have time to show you, to show the data. So actually, we found that when we overexpress endostatin in the saga mutant, uh, it does not rescue homeostatic potentiation. So it indicates that it's only one of the target chain that is controlled by the saga complex. And probably this epigenetic regulation protein complex control an entire signal network in glia. And we're in the process to find other downstream targets that are really controlled by the saga complex for homeostatic potentiation. Yeah. Great, great. Thanks. Okay. Thanks Nina, for a great talk. Now we have a second talk with John. The fun okay. right. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ting Ting. Awesome talk. Okay, so now our next speaker is Ben Novich. He's a professor in the Department of Neurobiology at UCLA. He received his bachelor's degree at the University of Vermont and then a master's and PhD at Harvard, where he worked with Andrew Lasser studying uh, gene regulation controlling skeletal muscle development, um, including the role of cell cycle regulators like RB. He then uh, did a postdoctoral fellowship at Columbia University with Tom Jessel. He's actually the second speaker in a row. Uh, it was a postdoc from uh, Jessel Lab. Uh, Julia Kaltschmidt was last week. So here he studied uh, gene regulation controlling motor neuron subtype identity. Um, in a beautiful paper in Neuron, actually a classic paper, most of the Jessel papers are classic, but this is a classic, classic paper in Neuron. He showed that oleg 2 functions as a transcriptional repressor to control motor neuron differentiation in the developing spinal cord. Um, if you just look at the paper, the, there's a beautiful in situ hybridizations of chick embryo spinal cord showing restricted expression pattern of oleg 2 in the ventral neural tube. He then followed that up with another paper um, in Neuron, also a classic, where he um, started to, ex uh, well, before his paper, it was known that sonic hedgehog secreted from notochord starts pattering the floor plate and motor neurons and through, uh, ex through the function of homeo domain and uh, BHLH uh, tr transcriptional regulators, but these had mostly been transcriptional repressors. 
he identified the first uh, uh, transcriptional activator uh, function in this process, the uh, retinoic acid signaling and uh, retino retinoid receptors to show that these were important to specify motor neuron identity. He then started his own laboratory, first at University of Michigan and then um, at UCLA, where he currently is. He continues to study the role of gene regulation in motor neuron identity, signaling pathways for uh, functions in neural progenitor cells. And recently, he's, a, he's developed human organoid models to study neural network formation and function. And I think he'll be sharing that with us today. So uh, go ahead, Ben. Uh, you're, you're still on mute. Yeah, sorry. After all this time, you'd think. Can you see my slide OK? Um, it's still booting up, uh, at least on my end. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Let's yep, see. There you go. OK, Let's you go. got it there? Yep. All right, well, thank you, Aaron. Um, and I really appreciate everybody coming out to hear my talk. It's, it's great to have the opportunity to present to uh, such a, a broad audience. Um, so yeah, so my lab's been interested over the past few years about moving a little bit away from our, our work in spinal cord and moving towards uh, studying the developing brain. And I've become increasingly interested in trying to um, really get, get on board with the idea that we can study human development um, using things like stem cell models. And so for many years, I was working in the in the stem cell field, like with monolayer culture of motor neurons, but then I started to become interested in the 3D models. So let's see if my slides work here. So here's the, the big problem. I'm hoping that that did advance. That, did that advance, Aaron? Is that okay? Uh, it didn't advance. It did it not. It did advance. not. Oh, there you go. There it goes. Oh, so it seems like it's very slow. <laughs> That's going to be a bit of a problem. I'm just going to try st stopping it and then restarting it just to see if that, if it gets any better. Um, I don't know why. It, 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 it actually advanced very rapidly on my on my end. So oh, okay. you don't seem to have a problem. Maybe it's Aaron's problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> otherwise, I'm going to be bringing up things. It's going to be a little bit. Uh, all right. Please raise, let me know if it's going badly. Uh, anyhow, so the thing that we're the problem that we're trying to study is what is the basis of, of human neurological disease? And so, of course, we've advanced quite a lot societally from where we were several hundred years ago. <laughs> Although sometimes it feels like we're we sometimes get dragged backwards, uh, but there we thought that the idea of the solution would be to let the demons out of one's head. Uh, but we now know that really like the, the seed of disease comes from the brain and, and more importantly, circuits within the brain. And I think that most of us on this call would, would appreciate that, you know, that our, the current understanding of disease is that really it's something that we can think about the level of, of circuits and potentially even micro circuits. And I'm sort of depicting here a very simplified version of, of neural circuitry, which is really just looking at the, the, the balance between excitation and inhibition on a local scale within the cerebral cortex. And this essentially is sort of like where we're trying to go with a lot of our studies right now to try to see if we can like start with something very small and then sort of like deduce like larger uh, notions from that. And so one of the outputs of neural circuitry, which is just more directly related to uh, neurological dysfunction, is actually network levels activities, which can be read out by many different ways. Uh, a very traditional way is by looking at um, uh, rhythmic activities like neural oscillations or brain waves. And so one of the things we're, we're becoming increasingly interested in is how do we actually measure these sort of things in a, in a reduced model. And so historically, the way that people have gone about trying to study some of these problems has been by using animal models, uh, rodents being very popular. Uh, and obviously, it's a great model for, for many aspects of development. But I think the realization over the past decade has been that the human brain is quite different than the mouse brain, both in this in the sense of scale, the size scale, as well as the, the both the diversity of cell types and also abundance of certain regions. And so one of the things that we and many others are, are actively trying to do is to try to bring in stem cell based models to be able to like study some of the human biology that's involved here. And so I'm just going to basically just talk about a couple of stories, some of which are published. Actually, a lot of these have been more recently published in this, this Nature Neuroscience paper. But I just wanted to give a shout out to the people who did the work, most of the work, Momoko, uh, and Ron Mall, who are both postdocs in my lab. She's now at Irvine, he's now at UCLA, and a student, Jesse Booth, who's still in my lab, and a ton of collaborators, which I'll, I'll list at the end. So the first thing that we needed to do, and I'm just jumping right into it, is we needed to uh, come up with a way of making brain organoids. And we weren't very satisfied with the, the early generation of brain organoids because they were very heterogeneous. And that made it very difficult to think about how we were going to approach studying um, neurological disease. So thanks to Momoko, um, who had, had trained in the Yushiki Sasai's lab before she came to my lab, uh, she really brought to my lab expertise in really like learning how to make and, and teaching us how to make these really beautiful, uh, very regular looking brain organoids. And 
this is a, it was published in her paper in, two, 19, in 2017. And this is just sort of showing like a little bit of like the, how these things develop. You can see that each one of these organoids that is developing has a very kind of like consistent expression of early developmental markers of the of the cortical progenitor cells, this yellow color here and the green color here. Uh, over a few more weeks in development in the dish, they start to like um, epithelialize to form these rosette-like structures, which are essentially like little miniature neural tubes. And then over time, these uh, will, will develop further and they start to like take on this really nice laminar architecture with progenitors on the inside and differentiated neurons on the outside. And you can see here in this particular um, image here, we've got the intermediate progenitors of the interface between the neurons and the, the, the radial progenitor cells. So in many ways, it really recapitulates a lot of the cytoarchitecture of the developing brain in vivo. And to sort of reinforce this point, I just want to show just like a side-by-side -side view of, of an organoid cortex. This is a week eight cortex, so Little bit earlier than you know, perhaps we should have used for the comparison, uh, but comparing it to a, a human fetal cortex, staying with the same markers. And I think the hope that you can appreciate is that the, the, the expression of these key developmental markers is preserved between the two specimens and the laminar architecture at, at kind of like at a, at a rough value is pretty similar to, to one another. And we also had done a ton of transcriptomic analysis in collaboration with Dan Geshwin's lab in this, this earlier paper of ours. So along the way, I just wanted to point out that some of the things we learned. So one was that when you make a brain organoid and you, if you wanted to study some of the human specific features, which are these cells here, which are the outer radial glial cells, they are formed, but they're not very abundant. And so one of the things we were able to do is to figure out tricks to be able to make uh, more of those cells to study some of these human specific features. And this was done by, uh, by adding a growth factor called LIF, which stimulates receptors on the outer radial glial cells to stimulate their proliferation. It also has the impact, the impact of increasing astrogliogenesis as well. And so this is something that we, we're currently playing with to try to get into uh, some studies about the biology of the outer radial glial cells and what drives them and drives their expansion in, in, in higher species. Another thing that we've done with the organoid model is we set out to first start to model disease. And so at the time that we were doing these studies, uh, there was another pandemic that was just emerging, uh, and that was the Zika virus. Uh, uh, and so this is now seems like <laughs> kind of like old, old news, but it's still actually a pandemic. It's still like we haven't gotten rid of Zika virus, and it still does cause severe microcephaly in, in children. Uh, and so one of the things we and many other labs around the world did was we used the organoid model as a really nice um, platform to try to understand how does the Zika virus uh, impact the developing brain. And we did this by ad by collaborating with some of our UCLA colleagues, Ren Sun and Gang Hung Chang in particular, and their colleagues. Uh, and what we were able to do is to show that Zika virus predominantly affects the neural progenitor cells within the within the, the developing organoids. It spares the, neur the neurons to to a first approximation. Uh, and what it does is it leads to reduction in the overall growth of the brain organoids. And if you cut cryosections through these things and stain them for, uh, for progenitor markers or differentiated neuron markers, and these are the images of the, 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 um, the, or, oops, sorry, the organoids that were, uh, that were infected with Zika virus, you now see that the red is kind of missing, in, particularly in the progenitor cells, and it's replaced with blue, and blue are dying cells. So what Zika virus does is it infects the progenitor cells and it kills them, um, leading to deficits in, in growth. And so um, we also use this as a platform to test out the waters of, can we use this for therapeutic discovery? And, and in these two papers, we were able to show that we were able to use this infection of organoids and, and, and use uh, like drugs that people have been identifying in other screens uh, as potentially therapeutically useful to show whether or not they would have protective effect on human neural progenitor cells. But really what I want to talk about more today is not the pre previous work, but, but some of the more recent work, which is trying to get at this level of how do we study circuit activity. And so to do this, we had to think a little bit harder about like how can we actually create organoids that have the cellular and, uh, complexity and the functional complexity to really elicit uh, circuit level activities. So we knew that from the beginning, we can make these, these, these cortical organoids and they had you know, nice uh, expression of different markers that are characteristic of the upper and, and lower levels of the, of the cerebral cortex. Uh, but that 
would only get us, uh, you know, like just the excitatory part of the, of the brain. We wouldn't expect to have much of the inhibitory neurons. So to do the, to get around that, uh, we and, and like many other labs around the world, we came up with with ways of actually transforming the organoid protocol so that we can now make ventralized organoids by treating them with sonic hedgehog agonists. And this now changes their composition so that they now express markers of of of, of ganglionic eminence progenitor cells uh, and and the and differentiated neurons that will come out of those cells. And what this allows us to do is to now have organoids that have a lot of inhibitory interneurons. And so in nature, what we know happens is that most inhibitory interneurons for the cortex actually derive from the ganglionic eminences and they migrate up into the cortex. And what Sergei Pasca and, and Jürgen Oblik and, and we, our own lab independently found is that you can take these two types of organoids and fuse them together. And nature kind of wants uh, the, those, those inhibitory interneurons want to migrate into the cortex. And so you can actually see robust migration of the inhibitory neurons from the ganglionic eminence organoid into the cortex. And, uh, and when you do this, what you end up com com uh, com com you know, making is a composite uh, where you get a nice mixture of an excitatory and inhibitory interneurons. And you can actually stain uh, for synapses, as you can see that there's an abundance of both excitatory pre and post synaptic markers and inhibitory pre and post synaptic markers, suggesting that we're really getting this, this cellular and synaptic complexity. Um, just one of the questions that often had comes up, but it was just straight, straight away, is like, what about the balance of inhibitory neurons to, you know, to excitatory neurons? Uh, because one of the things that, that is interesting in nature is that there is this magic number of about like 25 to 30 percent, which is what the, the average density is in most species of inhibitory neurons within the cortex. And we, we wondered, could we actually achieve that or did we achieve that in these, these fusion organoids? And so we did studies in which we label one of the organoids with uh, a virus that carries tomato and then ask, like, you know, like, just watch those cells migrate from from the ganglionic eminence into the cortex. And this is just sort of showing the cortex when you label it doesn't go into the ganglionic eminence. But if you quantify the number of, of tomato positive cells and you can find in the cortex, we were getting numbers that were in about like a 15 to 20% range. And this was quite consistent across different um, numbers of, or, of organoids per batch and different batches of organoids. So it was quite consistent. And then when we also uh, stained it with just GAD65 as just a marker for inhibitory interneurons, that some of which would probably not have been labeled by the tomato, we actually got a slightly higher number of about somewhere between 20 to 30%. So bottom line is we actually find that the consistency of the migration seems to be pretty um, pretty regular. And we also think that the balance of excitation inhibition is pretty you know, close to what it should be in vivo. So what about the activities? So to do this, uh, we've turned to uh, just taking adopting all the all the tricks that that are currently in use for for studying uh, uh, neural circuit functions in intact animals. So we were able to collaborate with our upstairs neighbor Payman Golshani in adapting um, his system of using optogenetics and two photon microscopy uh, to study uh, GCAMP. Um, we use viruses to deliver GCAMP to the organoids, or in this case, a fusion organoid, and then we can basically measure out the the activity of individual neurons across the field. Uh, in this case, we're reading it out as a heat map where each each horizontal uh, line is, is an individual neuron and the heat map just shows us the, the peak of activities. And this allows us to sort of see like a global view of what's going on with the activity. We can measure spike frequency, we can do hierarchical clustering and so on. And importantly, we, we can measure things like synchronizations. This is a fusion organoid with a ganglionic eminence. And so one of the things we wanted to know is how important are those inhibitory interneurons? So this is the same organoid on the left. This is the, the one on the right is now been treated with bicuculin. And immediately you can see that there's a flash of synchronous firing. And you're gonna see this again and again and again as it goes through. And this is a sort of like hypersynchrony that we can induce in this system. So what this tells us is that, that we have complexity to our neural network activities, and it seems to be like very much dependent upon interneuron functions. If you were cancel them out with drugs, it changes the activity path, um, the activity profiles quite a lot. So another way that we've been going about this is uh, through a collaboration with Ishvan Modi's lab, we started to think about what can we measure uh, beyond uh, the, the, the calcium signaling using uh, other uh, ways to measure things like local field potentials. And so local field potentials are something that are very famously uh, uh, used to measure uh, higher complex uh, brain activities like brain waves in humans using techniques like EEG. Now, obviously we're not, we don't, haven't designed to make an EEG for, for organoids yet, but one of the things we can use are probe electrodes that we can stick into these organoids. And when we do that, we can actually measure uh, rhythmic neural activities 
if you blow it up here, you can sort of see these, these squiggles of activities. And then if you deconstruct these into its component frequencies, what you can actually find is that we can, we can break out uh, component oscillatory rhythms that are actually like very similar to the types of oscillatory rhythms that one finds in human brain waves that are measured by techniques like EEG. And so we could also, uh, but if we put it into like a, a spectral density plot, we can actually measure the the power of some of those 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 uh, brain wave activities, which gives us a measure of of different act levels of activity within the organoids. And I should also just point out that when we did these oscillatory measurements, we also did the, tried these things out on cortex alone or cortex cortex fusions, and we didn't see the any oscillatory activities. We didn't see these 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 sort of wave like uh, wave like forms. So this really tells us that these are are ganglionic eminence interneuron dependent activities. So what about disease? So. We wanted to then test out what could we see dysfunction in, in these oscillatory activities and we went looking at a neurological disease model. And so uh, we initially wanted to start with something that we, we kind of knew something about. And also because it was very convenient for us that some of our colleagues at UCLA had made uh, IPS cells from patients with Rett syndrome, which is a severe neurodevelopmental disorder, which is of course well known. Uh, it's famously associated with mutation in the MECP2 gene. And one of the things that was also very appealing for us was that, that, that in addition to a lot, a lot of motor dysfunction in these patients, they also have a very high incidence of seizure activity. And the person, Ron Mall in my lab, who was studying these things was training as a, as a, as a, as a um, neurologist to treat seizures. And so he wanted something that where he could actually look at the seizure component. The other thing that's, that was convenient about Rett syndrome is that it was easy to make isogenic uh, cell lines because the MECP mutation is uh, actually mosaic within the patients. And so you can, when you make IPS cells, you can actually separate out uh, the cells that either do or don't have MECP2 expression, allowing us to have um, isogenic control lines for these experiments. And so the first thing we did was we made organoids from these, from these uh, patients, um, and we've, we've now done it for a few patients. And the thing that we found was a bit disappointing, perhaps, was that we were able to make organoids from the wild-type control cells and from the MECP2 mutant isogenic line, or you know the, the mutant lines. This is showing MECP2 protein is completely gone. Uh, but at face value, they look kind of the same. And we did the same thing with the ganglionic eminence organoids, and we generally found that, again, they look very similar to one another. So it was very difficult by immunohistochemistry to really discern much of a difference in uh, the development of these organoids at face value. We uh, had to turn to single cell transcriptomics to actually start to tease out that there were definitely some more, more subtle phenotypes in there. So this is just showing uh, single cell analysis of the fusion organoids. Uh, and this is just showing the maps of the different types of, of cell populations that we were able to, to find in these organoids. And on the right here is just giving sort of like a map of all the, some of the markers that you might be familiar with that demarcate these different populations of cells. And some of the things we observed in these organoids was that there actually was a difference in the balance between progenitors and neurons, where the mutant organoids, the MECP mutant organoids, seem to have an ex somewhat accelerated differentiation. Uh, compared to the control. And what I think this is actually kind of interesting is that there was a recent paper from Paolo Arolata's lab where they actually looked at a mutation of several different autism risk genes, and they actually saw a very similar trend where there seems to be an acceleration of differentiation in many cases in these, these autism spectrum disorders. So I think that there's something that's quite consistent about that, that trend uh, in these, these organoid models, perhaps. And the other thing we were able to do was to ask questions about like the diversity of interneuron subtypes, because we thought that these might actually actually have something to do with controlling neural functions. And so we were able to take the interneuron cluster and, 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 and examine it in, in greater detail. Uh, we were able to identify at least seven major groups of inhibitory interneurons within these, these uh, fusion organoids. And here, when we did the comparisons, we, we again saw that there were some subtle differences in the abundance of, of certain classes of interneurons. And this may have some bearing on what I'm going to show you in a moment in terms of uh, just differences in the neural activities within these organoids. But this kind of just shows the general approach by which we can kind of characterize these organoids and look at the individual contributions of cells and then potential, and then look at how it, how it may impact the overall um, activity profile. Another thing that I was very like satisfied or very pleased by was when we went looking at the genes that were differentially uh, expressed in the, the MECP2 mutant versus control fusion organoids, we had a list of genes that were most upregulated and downregulated. There was a lot of overlap uh, with, with autism risk genes. Um, this is what the red here means. 
and epilepsy, which is where the green means. And I was also particularly struck by the fact that at least four of the genes on that, that top list were all genes that were associated, you know, independently, they were associated with RET-like phenotypes in patients. So if we knew nothing about this disorder, this really gives me confidence that we would have stumbled upon, we would have, this is approach is gonna take us into something that really has like, I think grounding in reality uh, with, with what's important for the disorder. So what else do these genes do? So we did gene ontology and what we found was that the majority of these genes are associated with synaptic assembly. And so uh, that really kind of turned our attention to what do we see about synaptic defects within these organoids. And so here we turn to using immunohistochemistry uh, where we're just staining for pre and post synaptic markers and calling when we see the coincidence of that, uh, at least evidence for a synapse. And so we can quantify uh, using Ameris renderings, we can quantify the density of synapses in these, in these organoids. And when one of the first things we saw was that in the mutant organoids, we saw that there was a higher a density of excitatory synapses um, in these structures. And when we did the same thing for inhibitory synapses, we actually found that there was surprisingly very little difference. But nevertheless, what the end result seems to be is that there is an imbalance of excitation over inhibition in the mutants that we don't see in the control. So that gave us a clue that we might expect to see some activity differences as well. So here is now like turning to calcium indicator imaging within uh, the control and versus the mutant cortex and ganglionic eminence organoids. This is the control and it has a kind of a, a profile which looks very similar to what I showed you before with, with our controls. This was the, the mutant here and you already saw one flash and you'll see another flash of hypersynchronous activity in a second. And this is what the quantitative analysis looks like, where what we found is that the mutant organoids would show uh, like, you know, interspersed, but they were, but they were still very, re pretty regular. We would see these periods of hypersynchrony. So, and so there was a higher amplitude of the synchronies and there was just more neuron spiking in general within the, the mutant organoids. So it really suggested that there, there is something that probably is related to that, that imbalance in synaptic um, ex excitation and inhibition. What about the oscillations? So we then of course went looking to see what does the oscillatory activities look like within these organoids. And this is now measuring from the isogenic control organoid. So very similar to the, um, the previous images I showed, which was actually from H9 derived um, organoids. This is now coming from the isogenic control um, patient organoid. You can see that there's oscillatory activities which are broad spectrum. So we can see, we can see nice peaks of delta through gamma. Um, when we make to the same measurements from the mutant organoids, what we actually found was that the rhythms are completely different. They seem to be like very shallow and, you know, and, and very rapid. And as a consequence of that, we have a tough time actually measuring uh, significant levels of most of these, these uh, kind of higher frequency oscillatory activities. So that like when you plot it in this way, you see very uh, few actual peaks appearing. Uh, and this is just quantitation where we actually show, again, can measure here the spike frequency, which is greatly up, up, up in the, the mutant organoids and reductions in the power of some of these uh, higher frequency rhythms like the, the gamma in particular. One thing we did find though, though even though these were generally flat in their activities, because they're going so fast here, we could find transient, very short uh, episodes of, of hyper um, hyperactivities, uh, which re represent in, the, in these sort of plots as high frequency oscillations. So things that are in the 200 plus range, which is you can kind of like make out just with these, these high uh, things here. So this is a, actually a pathological signature that is frequently seen um, during epileptic seizures in patients. And so what we would like to believe is that, that this organoid model has recapitulated some aspect of that seizure disorder which the patients may be experiencing or may experience. Um, if we have the ability to, to see a pathology, this now of course gives us an opportunity to ask, can we do something about it? And so we decided to see whether or not we could actually try to silence that seizure-like activity uh, by using both a conventional drug, uh, which is sodium valproate, which is something that is, has been historically given for, uh, to treat uh, seizure disorders, uh, but also to test out a, a new candidate drug called pethifrin alpha. And so pethifrin, why pethifrin? So this is an analog, this is actually an inhibitor of the P53 pathway. And the reason for this is um, our collaborator, Bill Lowry, had published a study a couple of years earlier showing that like he did a, um, an analysis of 2D culture of, of neurons made from MECP2 mutant um, iPS cells. It was actually his cells that we were using. And what he found was that when he looked at gene expression differences, he found that there was an elevation 
of, of stress-related genes, which were linked to the P53 pathway. And he was able to, he was able to restore or like silence them with that activity, that stress activity by treating them with this drug pifithrin alpha. So we tried it in our organoids. And this is actually showing that when we first did the valproate, that valproate could suppress the spiking of the neurons, but it didn't uh, really bring back any of the, the oscillations in the gamma range. And it didn't suppress the high frequency oscillations, which is what we're, we're calling seizure-like activities. But interestingly, when we added pifithrin, it actually acted pretty well as a spike an inhibitor by itself, but in this case, it actually started to bring back some gamma rhythm and it started to suppress some of the high frequency oscillations. And this is just showing the quantitation that we're able to restore some gamma rhythm to these organoids. So we're pretty excited about this because it kind of shows that there's something about this stress pathway, which may have something to do uh, with, with, with having an impact on oscillatory activities. And just as a disclosure, uh, Bill and I and some others here, we've actually uh, have a, a patent application in uh, for the use of pifithrin and some analogs that we've been generating with a chemist uh, for the treatment, treatment of Rett syndrome and possibly some other intellectual disabilities. So with that, I'll just kind of just summarize the, the main points, which is that uh, brain organoids that, that you know, we've been able to make uh, seem to be able to faith faithfully recapitulate many aspects of the, human develop of the developing human brain. Uh, I think that these the cortical fusion organoids are are gonna be a really powerful system for studying um, complex uh, network level activities like oscillations and to be able to study both the normal and pathological functions of inhibitory interneurons. I think they're very well suited since we have these assays that are interneuron dependent that we can use this to probe you know, what goes on with interneurons in these circuits. Um, with respect to Rett syndrome, we can see that this is associated with abnormal network activities, hypersynchronies, uh, changes in the oscillatory uh, rhythms, and we've been able to recapitulate some of the epileptiform activities, which is something that the patients themselves um, experience. And I would like to believe that the approach that we're using here is not unique to Rett syndrome, but rather is something that we might be able to use for many other neurological disorders. And to sort of end with just a teaser of where, where we're at right now and where we're trying to go, we've been trying to broaden this approach now to study a few other different disorders. So one is we're not done with, with Rett syndrome. One of the things we're interested in is how there's a diversity of different types of, of mutations in MECP2, which have different clinical severity. Can we actually see, does that have any bearing in this, this model to see whether or not there's differences in their oscillatory activities? And this is something we're just getting started with. But at first you know, glance, what you can see is that these these, these, these uh, measurements of calcium uh, signaling activities uh, are different between these two different patient um, IPS lines, uh, yet their oscillatory dysfunction seems to be quite comparable, which, which we think is quite interesting. Uh, we've also been looking at a few different um, other forms of autism and epilepsy. This is an example of a CHD2 mutation organoid. This is an example of a sodium channel mutation organoid. Uh, and you can see that their activity profiles look different than these. Um, the, this one here is particularly severe where you, it looks like almost like the organoids where we treated them with bicuculin. There's so much uh, uh, power and consistency in the, uh, in the spiking activity. And this, you can see the scale here is, is like an order of magnitude more than it is here. And you can even see the appearance of high frequency oscillations appearing in these spectral density plots because it's happening so frequently. So this is sort of where we're at. We're, we're working on trying to um, um, to use this as an approach to try to uh, like really look at the network level dysfunction within a, a variety of neural pathologies, starting with IPS cells. And with that, I'll just return to just thanking all the people in my lab and other labs who have helped us with this project. So Momoko, Ron, Mall, and Jesse uh, really did the lion's share of driving the projects, uh, helped with a team of other uh, students. Um, and we were able, really blessed with great collaborators at UCLA and elsewhere, Mike Gandell, Payman Golshani, Ishvan Modi, uh, our, our virology um, colleagues. And I wanted to give a shout out to Jack Parent and Bill Lowry for giving us um, some cells to start with. And I'd be happy to take questions if anybody has any. Thanks so much, Ben. Awesome talk. Um, Hongye? Yeah, really, really awesome talk. Um, so my question is that when you add leaf to the organoids, it promotes the proliferation of outer radio clear. At the same time, you mentioned that it also enhances estrogenesis. So do you have an idea how the adding leaf will, you know, how, how does that trigger the uh, enhanced estrogenesis? 
Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, many studies, um, Ben Barris, others have have pointed to LIF and like CNTF as being like factors that that can actually stimulate um, astrogliogenesis. Um, in our case, I mean, we 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 actually it was sort of a, a bit of a um, of a happy mistake. So when we first did these experiments, we were we were driven by the um, the work of Arnold Kriegstein's lab, which had had done single cell profiling of the outer radial glial cells. And they found that lift receptors were enriched in those cells. And when we did our, um, we were first making organoids, we went looking for um, activation of the lift receptor and which goes through the STAT3 pathway. And we didn't see signs of activation. And then when we added lift, it, it worked. And we, we got, we got uh, activation of STAT3 pathway and we got a lot more outer radial glial cells. But we were using mouse lift uh, in those experiments, not realizing that mouse lift it doesn't bind to the receptor very strongly. And so it gives a mild stimulation. And so a mild stimulation seems to be favorable for giving you um, outer radial glial expansion. But if you now turn to human lift and if you give high doses, it'll drive it very strongly to astrogliogenesis. And so it's a kind of a bit of a, um, it's something that it has to be fine tuned. You have to use a little bit of lift and you have to put it at the right times. Otherwise, you can essentially just keep the cells from differentiating. Uh, so we actually find that if you if you treat them with like lift, they just keep proliferating and you can get this massive organoid forming. But it doesn't differentiate into neurons very well. Thank you so much. But the mechanism for how it actually does it is, you know, is a little bit mysterious. Ben, can I ask a question? Of course. So the different pathogenic mutations that you're studying and showing beautiful results, those are like maybe hammers. And I'm just wondering your thoughts or prospects for studying, modeling uh, sporadic disease, sort of, um, you know, autism spectrum disorders is a spectrum. And I'm just wondering if you took say 10 or, or more sporadic, uh, cells from sporadic autism or, or even like cells from, neurotypical individuals. I'm just wondering what's the variability in, um, going on here. And, and yeah. what are the prospects of studying in these models, um, sporadic disease, broad, broadly defined? Well, I think that there's, there's well, of course, great opportunity to do this. Um, the, you know, the real problem is going to be just the, you know, the sense of cost and scale uh, to be able to do these things. I mean, we, you know, I, I feel like right now, since we're still testing water, uh, about like the water is about like what can we actually do with the system and how consistent is it going to be even with a uh, a disease that has a strong phenotype. I think we have to sort of um, be cautious before I think going in straight in for sporadic things. But that said, I think that you know there was some you know early work by Flora Vaccarino's lab where they did this to try to look at and they they were looking at autism and, and found um, elevation of, of Fox G1 expression having an impact in interneuron formation. And I think that there's there definitely are opportunities to try to go with a you know idiopathic you know, um, you know, patient with no known mutation and try to use this as a discovery tool. Because I mean, one of the things that our single cell analysis showed us was that if we didn't know anything about Rett syndrome, we were able to identify other genes that are, you know, associated with, with Rett syndrome like phenotypes. So I think that it would be a viable way forward to try to, you know, get into the network of, of what has changed and, you know, and, and, and it might be contributing to the neural dysfunction. But I think we're, we're still, I mean, it would be a little bit of a kind of like jumping in, into the deep end and, and seeing what you find. But in terms of like the, the, like the, the, the range of mutations, that's one of the things that we um, actually just got a new grant to, to study. So we were, we were going to try to model the spectrum disorder aspect of it using uh, the spectrum of MECP2 mutations, because there, there are some that are associated with, with mild versus more severe disease. And we wanted to basically see how, do that, how does that get read out in an, in an organoid model of something we were, where we have some fundamental understanding? And another thing that's also that I didn't, I kind of glossed over is that the MECP2 um, patients, sorry, the, the Rett syndrome patients are actually mosaic for MECP2 mutation, whereas our organoids uh, are completely missing MECP2 altogether. And so this uh, is, is, is actually more like the, the models that were initially made for Rett syndrome in mice, where they tend to study the male, male mutants who have no MECP2 function rather than the, you know, like the, the females, which uh, would be, you know, more mosaic. So we're actually in the process of creating mosaic organoids. And I'm actually quite excited about this because then we can start to ask questions about how within one structure, a cell that does or doesn't have the, the, the functional protein, how does it develop in partnership? And also like how many 
bad apples do you need to have in a neural network to before you throw the overall function of the network you know into disarray thanks um, other questions Hi, so so beautiful work. So I'm working on I'm in CBD for uh, over ten years. So it's just so so, so amazing to see uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, so all all going on. So would you be su su suggesting the the uh, low gamma the loss of the low gamma will be due to the loss of some particular interneurons in the MSCB to knock out cells? Possibly, yeah. I mean, you know, there is a deficit in the parvalmium and positive population in particular. Yeah. Uh, and there's there's also some other ones that I'm which I'm now I'm like forgetting off the top of my head which ones they are, uh, but yeah, it's it's possible that 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 some of the dysfunction could be related to to deficits in certain or overabundance in in other cases. So yeah, some imbalance um, could definitely explain some of these phenotypes, but it's hard to. Um, yeah. But but my suggesting my comments is uh, so suggesting a oh, human organoid uh, is so different with my, my mouse model. Because is MCB knockout mouse is PVS going up, right? It was yeah. for a long time. Okay, someone raise yes, his hand. Okay, D. Yes. Uh, I won't call. I won't call it. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, this is a nice talk. Uh, I'm a post from Christian Lab. Indeed, yeah, we um we are very interesting about how how the maturation state of your organelles because you looks like you can do experiments in three to four months, and you can see the beautiful calcium waves. Do you measure how, what's the maturation state of both excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons? Yeah, the maturation state, we need to revisit it because we when we first did the maturation state, we just did like transcriptomics and we were kind of like using um, like comparisons to like, uh, you know, fetal brains at different stages of development. And we were pegging it at about, second trimester, but when we put them together with the interneurons, they seem to functionally mature more. And so I, I want to say that they're now probably looking like at least third trimester, if not like newborn in their, in their characteristics, but we haven't, we haven't gone in, back and actually done the transcriptomic comparisons to really like to say where they're at. Um, they, I mean, they are, I mean, like, I know that like Sergey Pasca has, has, you know, published that, you know, like he's got these organoids that he's kept around for a year or so, and they start to show changes in the expression of different receptors uh, that are, you know, um, that are, are characteristic of, of more mature neurons. And we're seeing part of the, we're seeing like the early expression of some of those, those changes, but not the full. And so I don't think that they're fully mature, what we're, what we're getting. Okay, thanks. But it's, it is a matter of practicality because we're able to see quite a lot even in the time frame that we're we're working, so we're we're encouraged to keep trying. <laughs> but if we can wait longer, we we will. <laughs> yeah, pretty promising. Thank you. Other questions? I mean, I have a million questions, but maybe one more, one and a half more. Um, what are your thoughts on using these models to study uh, neurodegenerative uh, phenotypes uh, that occur much much later? And then like the other question was, I've always been interested in this idea of, of penetrance of mutations. And I'm just wondering, so you're, so does, diseases don't, are, don't always start from birth and sometimes the phenotypes present later. Um, and I'm wondering, um, or, or maybe they do start during development and we just can't see them. I'm just wondering if you just take cells from, patient, from individuals who harbor mutations but don't have disease, do they now show phenotypes in the dish or, or is there some other changes that occur later that sort of induces that? Yeah, that's, I mean, the penetrance one is a tough one. I mean, because I think it's, I mean, I, I would like to believe that, I mean, and granted, I think that I, I, I might tend to go like, you know, but, but by the proverbial, like looking by the light, like by where the lamp is, like the lamppost, to be able to sort of study things. I'd like to be able to study a disease where I can, I can expect to find a phenotype. Uh, whereas a more, more mild one is going to be much harder to see. Um, so I, I don't know. I think we just need to do more. We need to just study more problems, more like study different diseases, um, be a little bit more patient about trying to look for like the, the questions about penetrance. Um, I don't really have an answer for that one. 
as a respect for for like the degeneration, I think absolutely yes. I think that it's going to be possible to do it. We're actually working um, a little bit. I mean, we're you know kind of. I feel like my whole life, I, I have a tendency to sort of move myself into areas where I probably should never go. <laughs> and so we actually have been starting to um, to try to model Alzheimer's um, in this model. Um, and uh, we're, we're collaborating with David Eisenberg here at UCLA, um, who's a structural biologist. And so one of the things we, we've actually found is that we can create tauopathy in the organoids just by overexpressing um, certain forms of tau. And you can actually see fibrils forming, and those fibrils can actually be trans, they can, you can spread them. If you'd make an extract from the organoids that have started to form the fibrils, they can actually pass on, pass on pathology to other, other uh, you know, cells that, uh, that are sensing like tau um, aggregation and such. So I think that it's going to be possible to create at least some elements of of, of neurodegenerative pathology within the organoid system. And so um, we are interested in trying to, you know, just see where we can take this. And the expectation is that if we start to create any sort of pathology, it's going to probably have an impact on the circuit level activities. And that's something we're particularly excited about because there's a lot of evidence out there that, that you can actually see changes in oscillatory rhythms as being like a, an early, you know, like a readout for, for network dysfunction in, in many disease states. Cool. And maybe Zalong or you could tell me if this is a crazy idea, but, but getting back to this um, uh, the neurodevelopmental diseases. If you took a, these simplex families, mom, dad, subject with ASD, and then sibling that's unaffected and made the organoids from all four of those, do you yeah. think you like you would only one of them would have these network defects, or maybe there's something in the parents already? I'm this is I'm just interested in because those are very genetically similar. I'm just wondering yeah. if that type of experiment is feasible. Yeah, or sure. informative. Yeah, I don't have an answer. I, I think as long as it has a particular mutation as strong as MCB2, we, we may have a clear difference with the, but in order to other like uh, more moderate mutations, we might not, why not? Yeah, that's okay. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you're, you know, you, you have the idea of the modifiers and I yeah. think there's absolutely some reason to think that you might see something. Um, it's just a question of just having, I think you just have to do experiments and see what you can find. Uh, you know, I mean, one of the things we, I think we're still grappling with the organoid field, it's, it's in its infancy, I like to think, uh, is, you know, that we, you know, like we still have problems with reproducibility and, and even though like we all like try to like quality control as much as we can, if it's a subtle mutation, it's going to be hard to like to, to really say like what is background noise and modifying that background noise from you know like a real genetic modifying effect and so i think it's until we have a little bit more control over the model i think it's going to be it's going to be a little bit tenuous doing it but in principle it's possible okay Great. thanks so much ben thanks ting ting thanks everyone thanks ben. thank you everyone for all the questions yeah, yeah. see everyone next next week Bye next week bye